So here's the latest thing that AI is taking over. AI is now infiltrating the world of spies and secrets. I know this sounds something straight out of a Tom Clancy novel, but trust me, this is the real deal. It's bigger than you can possibly imagine. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Today, let's take a look at the news that Anthropic, creators of the Claude AI model, well, they're teaming up with Palantir, the data analytics powerhouse already deep in defense and intelligence work. Their customers include the US government as well as some other nations. And guess who's backing all of this and making it possible? Well, it's AWS, Amazon's cloud service. They're bringing all their cloud muscle to the table to make this happen. And this is a real indicator of how AI is less science fiction these days and more integrated into the reality of government operations. And here's the kicker. This isn't some far off future. This is happening right now. And the question that I am most interested in is what does it even mean for an advanced AI model like Claude to work in these super secretive classified environments? And what are gonna be the ripple effects for everyone else? All right, to unpack this, let's start by breaking down who these players are and what each of them are bringing to the table. Anthropic, for example, is the brain behind Claude. Anthropic is the company, sort of OpenAI's sister company, if you will, that splintered off from there sometime near the very beginning. They, of course, produced Claude, the incredible AI model that has some pretty unique sort of quirks and abilities and is just incredibly good overall. And Anthropic, well, they're, they're pushing this safety first approach to AI development. That was kind of their tagline. And this is where it gets interesting. What does safety conscious even mean in this context? Especially when we're talking about AI potentially being used in military operations or to analyze intelligence data. This goes way beyond a vague set of ethical guidelines. Anthropic developed something called constitutional AI, where the model itself is trained on a set of principles, a sort of constitution that guides its decisions. They even have terms of service for government use, outlining what's allowed and what's strictly off limits. They're not just letting Claude loose in the world of espionage without ground rules. But how do you even write a constitution for AI? How do you make sure it actually follows it? It's mind boggling. Essentially, it's like teaching a child right from wrong, but on a massive algorithmic scale. It involves training Claude on data sets that reflect those principles, plus ongoing monitoring to keep it on track. It's not a uh, set it and forget it kind of deal. It's a constant feedback loop. And that's just the Anthropics part. Then there's Palantir, the data integration wizard. Their platform is this major player in defense circles and accredited to handle top secret information. They've achieved IL-6 accreditation, meaning they can work with data classified up to the secret level. IL stands for impact level. This is huge because it allows Claude to operate within these highly secure environments without risking leaks. Imagine the fallout if something like that were to slip through. And what about Amazon? What about AWS? They are the infrastructure backbone through their GovCloud service built for government agencies. Think of it as the digital fortress where all this processing happens. It's kind of interesting. We're talking about cutting edge AI, but it's all happening in this digital Fort Knox. So how does this partnership work in practice? What will Claude actually do within Palantir's AI platform? Will it be like an AI James Bond running around on secret missions? Well, maybe not quite James Bond, but it's definitely about making sense of complex information fast. Intelligence analysts deal with an overwhelming flow of data. They have satellite images, intercepted communications, social media chatter. Claude can cut through all of that noise, analyzing language, understanding context, even picking up on subtle shifts in sentiment that might indicate a real danger. It's like giving analysts an AI partner with a sixth sense for threats. And those AI insights can then inform decisions at the highest levels. Imagine government officials assessing real-time, data-driven analysis of complex situations on the ground. This has the potential to lead to more informed responses to global events. But of course, if AI is going to play a role in decisions that could affect national security, well, what about the risks? How can we be sure that AI won't be used for things it shouldn't be used for, even with the safeguards in place? And that's the million dollar question. 
A lot of people are wondering how real is the potential for misuse and if we're practically living in a spy thriller. Instead of gadgets and double agents, it's algorithms and data analysis. So what would it actually look like for an intelligence agency to use Claude in a real situation? Imagine a security threat emerging in a volatile region. Unfortunately, we have uh, quite a number of those in the world right now as we speak. And intelligence analysts would get bombarded with tons of information. We have satellite imagery showing troop movements, fragmented and coded communications. We have social media speculation. The signal to noise ratio is atrocious and we have to really focus on the signal, the important insights. And of course, this could be extremely overwhelming for a, a single human individual to handle. Even if you have a team, there's only so much they can process. And here every second counts. So this is kind of like trying to find a needle in a haystack or better yet, a needle in a haystack that's uh, on fire. And this is where Claude comes in, processing this mountain of data at lightning speed, connecting dots that even the sharpest human analyst might miss. And it doesn't just stop at, let's say, translation. It understands the nuances, the intent behind a message. It can pick up on changes in tone or urgency, potential red flags that signal a threat. It's like having an AI lie detector. But instead of heart rate or sweat, it analyzes language patterns and emotional cues. This reminds me of an interview that Sam Altman, the founder and CEO of OpenAI, did recently on the Y Combinator podcast, where he revealed this interesting idea, this interesting origin of the whole GPT architecture. In the early days of OpenAI, they were training a model that was able to sort of understand Amazon reviews. And one of the researchers stumbled upon the fact that there was this uh, sentiment neuron within the model. It was a very specific sort of piece of the model's brain that learned to figure out if a review on Amazon, a human written review, if it was positive or negative, if its sentiment was good or bad. Now, this model was never explicitly taught what a good review is, what a bad review is. It wasn't taught how to figure out how to do that. And yet somehow during the training process, it developed a sort of neuron that was able to accurately classify the sentiment of that review. And it was that sort of discovery that actually gave birth to the whole GPT series, right? So GPT 1, 2, 3, 4, and now, you know, the O1 model. That was kind of like the domino that set off that whole development process. It was just they figured out that these things can, with unsupervised learning, learn implicitly without being told. They could learn these things that would allow them to classify sentiment, for example. So the idea that Claude would be able to pick up on changes in the social media chatter or some sort of other form of communications it would sense the tone or urgency, the changes in those things spot certain potential red flags, etc. Certainly, it's not a far leap to say that this is very, very plausible. The cloud would be extremely effective at this. And after it's able to flag some of these things, these insights that it generates then would go to human analysts who can dig deeper. It's this powerful human AI partnership that enhances our ability to understand and respond to threats on the ground. At what point might we become more comfortable with maybe having the AI make certain decisions, especially certain decisions that come to national security, potentially life or death decisions. And of course, here, this is why ongoing training, oversight, and a human element are critical. Claude's insights are useful, but they still lack human intuition, judgment, maybe understanding of human nature. The goal here isn't to replace analysts with AI, but to augment their capabilities, like having an AI co-pilot in national security. And AWS plays a crucial role here too. It's not just providing infrastructure, it's bringing expertise in machine learning and security. With GovCloud, they meet the security requirements for handling classified information, so breaches are prevented. They're building a digital fortress for the sensitive data essentially a high stakes cybersecurity challenge protecting not just the data, but national security. And this is why this partnership is so significant. You get, you got the Anthropic, you have Palantir, you have AWS, sort of the Avengers of the tech world, if you will, working together to protect against AI powered threats. Because of course we are seeing that rise up as well. And of course, not everyone is thrilled about AI's role in national security, concerns about an AI arms race, power dynamics, 
and global tensions are very, very real. Could AI lead to increased conflict if certain countries gain a significant advantage? We are seeing more and more drone warfare, automated drone warfare, both over land and the air and on sea. These drones can be mass produced, extremely effective, very damaging. Some of the companies that produce these drones and their sort of promotional videos, if you go on YouTube, you can see some of these. They boast how effective their drones are and the kind of KPI, the key performance indicator, the metric that they use to kind of do this. I forgot the exact wording, but it's something like casualties per dollar or something like that. It's like for every dollar you spent, this is how much destruction you can uh, sow. Right, certainly a cheap drone that explodes into shrapnel could take out multiple people. The first human casualty from an automated, you know, fully AI controlled drone that was not connected to a human operator, that was not controlled by a human operator, that had no off button, basically, it just kind of seek and destroy. The, the first sort of recorded incidents of that happened in 2020, where drones, uh, the Cargoo drones or Hawk drones, they translate to English, they, the pursued fleeing enemy combatants and flew up to them and exploded into shrapnel completely without any sort of uh, human oversight. And that was 2020. And since then, the number of casualties due to autonomous drones has been rising steadily. So that's kind of a chilling thought. And this is why international cooperation is so crucial right now. This sort of warfare greatly places the advantage to the attacker. Right now, defending against these drones is difficult. We have companies like Anduril that are producing certain things that could be used to defend against drones, but still, there's a massive offensive advantage. It's, it's very cheap to produce these drones. They do a lot of damage. They're hard to defend against. So the person that sort of unleashes their cloud of drones first will have the advantage. There's an incentive to be the first to attack. And so this is why we need these conversations about AI ethics, responsible development, and potential risks. A lot of people that are all about AI safety and talking to Congress and the US government about how scary AI is and how we should limit it and pause it, some of those people are strangely silent when it comes to talking about AI being used in the military. Now, of course, if you use AI responsibly, it could help us address the world's most pressing issues, disease, poverty, improve things like pollution, climate, improve health, and potentially even improve how we manage conflict, how we manage war. But of course, how we choose to develop this technology, what things we find important, all this starts with education and awareness, staying informed, having open conversations, all of us engaging in these discussions, not just as observers, but as participants, this will help us shape the future of AI. Let me know what you think. Did you find it strange that Anthropic, the AI safety company, the company that a lot of people kind of look at as the safe company, the one that's taking AI safety very, very seriously, do you find it strange that they're teaming up with things like Palantir? And by the way, I personally like, for example, Alex Karp, the CEO of Palantir. He's a very polarizing person. I certainly don't agree with everything he says, but he speaks his mind and he's very straightforward, which I like. I do want people that are the people that control AI and the spy companies, the national intelligence, the military sort of backbone of nations like US, for example, and, and other big players on the world stage. Certainly it's good that they stand for something and they're not shy about expressing it. At least you know where they stand, what their motivations are. We did a video recently where there was an interview with the founder of Anduril, that company that builds a lot of the high-tech military applications powered by AI oftentimes uh, for the US government. One of the things that he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but something along the lines of, if we as in US has the best and scariest and most overwhelming technology, that would actually produce peace because there would be small incentive to start a war. The more overpowered one side is, the less incentive there is for other nations to go to war. And I believe Alex Karp of Palantir kind of thinks along maybe some of the same lines. And he even routinely sort of shows disgust for, for example, some of the engineers, let's say, in the Bay Area that are against developing military technology for the U.S., kind of like house cats that sort of don't really understand the privilege that is afforded to them, the safety that they're given by some of the sacrifices by of the military, the, the power of the military. So let me know what you think about that in the comments. Let me know if you're from the United States or not. 
a lot of my viewership is not in the United States. So let me know, because I certainly that will change what like, sort of a lens that you're viewing this through. And also, what do you think about the people that are very concerned about AI safety, about some potential Terminator 2 scenario that want to build agencies to control AI and pause AI, and they're really worried about these San Francisco-based companies developing AI, but at the same time, don't say a word when it comes to this sort of technology being used for military. Is that strange to you? If you're concerned about a Terminator 2-like scenario, wouldn't AI going and working with the military be the number one thing that you would be worried about? Or am I missing something? Let me know in the comments. My name is Wes Roth. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.